White people as a group historically, I, like I don't like it's hard to know what that means. Like if you want to talk about like German people, Russian people, Irish people, like there are achievements and things that you can give to specific nationalities, specific ethnicities, things in the past. But it feels like when people talk about like white as an overarching group, well, because sure. the reality is, is that like if you were to poll a, a ton, uh, like th uh, this is something. Oh my God, my mind. I changed so many opinions on politics when I realized this. There needs to be conscious decisions. I think it has to come from media first. And when I say media, I include alternative media as well. So people like you and me, um, you have to make the conscious decision to start to bridge gaps, right? You can do partisan content for your entire life, but you are f evil and you're destroying the country when you do that. When you do hyper-partisan content, you are saying that like, we are different from these people on a fundamental level. They're evil, we're good, and we're gonna fight that fight and advocate for a f national divorce. The, the issue that I have is that like, there is a difference between like white pride and black pride. Like, if we're honest, the histories between these two things are different, and generally the sentiments behind them are different, right? What is like, the difference? Um, I think the difference is that generally, white people are pretty okay in the United States on the qualification of being white. Um, now, there are poor white people, but their lives aren't because they're white, they're because they're poor. Or there might be white people that are addicted to drugs, but their lives aren't because they're white, they're because they're hooked to opiates. Um, whereas for black people, African Americans specifically, descendants of slaves, a lot of their lives today are still a little bit not because their parents were poor or their grandparents were poor, but because there were racial policies in the United States from 64 and earlier that actually like racially impacted people. So I, I can, I'm very empathetic. So you uh, only get to have pride if you struggle? I mean, like- I'm not, I, I'm not saying you can see, only- that, that's, here's, here's that a, is what you're saying. Well, no, 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 I, hold on, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that like, I can understand people treating the things a bit differently, sure. but the problem is that people take it a little bit too far, and instead of saying like, well, hold on, I think that there needs to be a special, unique place for black people to talk about their place in the US and the history in the US, that evolved into white people, they can't talk about anything related to whiteness, and now we're only gonna talk about black issues, and if you even dare challenge that, you're racist. Like, that evolution is very toxic, and I think that that change is what has, like, destroyed so many of the conversations. Um, thinking back, like, to the phrase, like, it's okay to be white, like, the response to that should've just, or, like, white lives matter, the response to that should've just been like, yeah, they do, but, like, that's not what we're talking about right now. And, like, that's it, instead of, like, no, you can't say that, that's hateful, it's like, why fight against that? Like, it's so stupid. Right. Uh, I I don't I didn't quite follow you there at, at the end. I mean I, I don't I mean I there is a, also a kind of double standard of when you know someone has Irish pride or something like that. Mm. It's like oh that's so cool and beautiful and poetic and things like that. Someone says they have German pride and they uh, people have a diff little bit of a different opinion or Russian pride because it's bigger and stronger and more powerful and can actually affect the world. Unlike uh, you know I don't know Irish Catholic nationalism or something like that. But you can't. You can't just say, okay, it's good if it's weak and it's bad if it's strong. I mean, you, it's, it's a natural human tendency to want to be a part of a bigger tribe, something bigger than yourself, civilization even. And so it, it can't just be justified if people are not politically powerful. Yeah, I think, I mean, it just, it's going to depend on the type of movement you're in and like where you're coming from. Like, because realistically, like when somebody says white pride, I don't really know, like, like, White people as a group historically, I, like I don't like it's hard to know what that means. Like if you want to talk about like German people, Russian people, Irish people, like there are achievements and things that you can give to specific nationalities, specific ethnicities, things in the past. But it feels like when people talk about like white as an overarching group, at least in my mind, the only thing I think of is slavery, <laughs> because I'm like, well, what right. did white people do versus like or you black think, people? You, or you think it's almost too generic and kind of yeah, vague. that's the issue. Like, and then is, when somebody it, appeals, what to does something... it mean? You you go to Target as opposed to the dollar store? You're white or mm -hmm. something? Yeah, you know, I I agree with that. Whereas I think there. And then there's a slight difference too, because when you talk about like African American culture, there was a unifying culture between descendants of slaves because a lot of them can't even point back to the countries they're from. And so their culture basically starts at my great, great, great granddaddy was a slave and that's all I have. And here's the culture that I was thrust into that was thrust upon me. And then this is what we created out of that. And so I, I'm, a, I'm more sympathetic to, I understand why some people are like, I have African American pride, but it feels a little bit different. It's like, I have white pride. It's like, okay, well you can go to Ellis Island. You can see like exactly where your family came from, like your pride is gonna be a little bit more ethnically precise than that. And when you just say white pride, it feels a little bit strange, you know? I, I get what you're saying and I'm, I'm, I'm being sympathetic towards it. I, I have many of the same criticisms. One of the criticisms that I do agree with that you hear from the left 
is, um, you know, they'll, they'll show some image of some, you know, fatso screaming white pride or yelling at someone. And they'll be like, the, this is the white supremacist, you know? And then there's also that other kind of question of like, what are you actually standing for? What do you want? Yeah. Uh, I think that was a major question, the why question about the alt-right and why it failed and is kind of part of the past now mm -hmm. um, is because it couldn't answer. There was no like actual spiritual core to what whiteness is. Which I is think that's so many true. movements have that issue. Remember Occupy yeah. Wall Street? Yes. What the fuck did they want? That was a huge firm and it I, came I, and it went and like, what the fuck did you guys want? Or BLM and the riots and the police. Like, what did you guys want? To abolish policing? They tried that as a place. It didn't work. Like, what did you guys want? Um, the alt-right, Charlottesville, like, well, what do you guys want? And it's like, exactly. more Christianity, Catholicism? Not that. What, what more, like what? Like, yeah, there's an I, issue I, with a lot of misdirected anger today where it's like, channel it on something and figure out a policy or something to rally by Maybe leg, well, uh, legalize like marijuana or something, but find something that you want to champion. Well, Otherwise, that's it's- because America isn't offering that anymore. So when, when you think about, okay, I mean, I'll, I'll do two things real quick. So just, you know, be a little patient. So there, there is a white identity to the United States that is, I would say, overwhelmingly Protestant and overwhelmingly Anglo. But, and there were a lot of nativist battles against, you know, bringing in Italians and Central Europeans and, and so on in the 19th century between about from the Immigration Act of 1924 and let's say up to the 60s, I think there, are, and, and this was also um, coming after the progressive reforms that did a lot of great things in my opinion, but anyway, uh, I think there was a pretty coherent uh, white American public. Um, it was perhaps fleeting. It was kind of more Christian than Protestant, more European than Anglo-Saxon, uh, but it was a real thing. Um, but I, I also think that like, grasping onto that, holding onto it is kind of clinging to the past. I think we've moved beyond that period of time. It was a great time in many ways. It was a bad time if you were African American, or not so bad, but bad in many ways. Or if you're Chinese, an African or depending on where you were. I get it, I get it. Mm -hmm. But um, but it, it was something, and I think that was probably the essence of the Make America Great Again notion. It was about, again, going back to the past, rehearsing something. Uh, but I think the main thing is that America is not able to offer any overarching, coherent vision that's attractive, that's irrational even, that's exciting, Dionysian. And thus, we're kind of retreating into this like fragmented societies of BLM angst, alt-right angst, Fuentes yay angst, patri you know, screw the patriarchy angst. They're probably literally screwing the patriarchy. But that's what, anyway. I feel because but but, we're not offering anything. Mm -hmm. When John Winthrop, you know, before he even set foot on the soil, he had an idea of what America was. It was this New Jerusalem concept. It was a highly fundamentalist puritanical notion, one that I don't resonate with, to mm -hmm. be honest, but it was something. He defined it even before he was here. Um, we've had various ways in the, in, in the Cold War. I mean, I have this article I'm going to uh, publish, but it's about how you two kind of predicted the Cold War or ended the Cold War in some crazy way. Though we're torn in two, we can be one. They sang that in 1983 before 1989, 91, and everything changed. And so they were imagining some vision that you wanted to come be a part of. And I think for Bono and you too, is actually deeply Christian. This is an, and mm -hmm. there, there has to be something there, or we are gonna fragment into things like BLM and the alt-right. So here, this is something also that I, that I kind of think in terms of, so earlier I alluded to this idea that I feel like the idea of a unified America was a bit illusory. Um, I feel like we felt that way, or, or we feel like in the past it was that way. <clears throat> so Adam, um, when, when you talk about like <coughs> hip hop and you talk about like rappers, I feel like um, one thing that's really important for a lot of these guys that a lot of kind of middle class America, and I feel like people have lost, is, is where you're from. Oh yeah, it's, huge. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that I, I feel like in the United States, I feel like we used to be a lot more local, but again, because of the internet, I think something happened to where now the only thing, everybody knows Marjorie Taylor Greene. Everybody knows, like if you ask like a, a, a
conservative in Wyoming or Montana or whatever, like yes. who, which politician do you hate the most? They're going to talk to you about like people from the House of Representatives in New York. Yes. They're going to talk to you about people that have no impact on their lives whatsoever. Right. And I think that some, there's an illusion I think that's created in the past America where everybody's involved in their own communities and their own churches and their own unions and their own local politics scene. And you feel like you're kind of a unified America, even though this community and this community might be a totally about things, but in their own communities, they've achieved some sort of equilibrium where they feel comfortable and confident. But now, local politics, everybody's on this national level, and no way can you get 340 million people to all feel the same about anything. But in a weird way, we're, we all do feel the same. It's, it's kind of both, because, you know, the, like a rancher in Wyoming um, because he's on social media to some degree, it's going to be like those BLM riots, they're burning down cities like Antifa is coming from. And it's like, mm -hmm. listen, but let me as someone who is assaulted by Antifa, I can tell you like they are not coming to rural Montana. Like, just sure. you know, let you know. But I mean, but on that same all thing, immediate, though, we're brought together in this kind of incredible way. Yeah, but in like such a, but in a horrible way, uh, well, because the sure. reality is, is that like if you were to pull a, a ton of like th uh, this is something. Oh my God, my mind. And I changed so many opinions on politics when I realized this, is if you're trying to figure out what Americans feel like, first of all, get rid of the idea of Americans, number one. And number two, stop looking at national polling data because we don't vote national in anything. We vote for our representatives, we vote for our senators, and then we vote within our states for things. And when you start looking more granularly at American opinion, you start to realize more why things are the way they are. You might think that like, well, 52% of Americans support the legalization of marijuana or prostitution or gun control or whatever. But when you look state by state, state, you're like, okay, hold on. This breaks down way differently depending on where you're looking at things. But that's changed. But we're, the, try the we're trying to force- The is happening. It, it, yeah, it might be. But the problem is we're trying to force our national views on everything where we still have a system, whether we like it or even acknowledge it, that still very much works on the local level. I think BLM and policing is a really good example. We tried to come together as a country and make strong statements on policing, but policing is decided by your mayor. These right. are your most local elections. Obama's not going to fucking save you from a bad cop. Right. Trump's not going to do shit about an unfair prosecution, um, but we all are looking and obsessing at that national level, and then nobody looks at their local communities, and now we're like, well, I feel like we don't get along like we ever did before. It's like, I don't know if anybody from New York City in the year 1892 would have gotten along with somebody from, you know, some rural place, some rancher in Texas, but it felt like they did because they never talked to each other. They never had the opportunity to be exposed to each other. Let me other. try to bring some of these things together, because mm -hmm. you're, you're bringing up some very important topics. So, America has never been a coherent nation, and it's never been a nation state mm -hmm. at all. It has always been an empire in some degree or another. Sure. Uh, so there's there's actually a thinker who's out of favor now, who I, I think is a genius, uh, Jackson Turner, Frederick Jackson Turner, with this notion of the, the frontier. Mm -hmm. So in European languages, if you're, let's say, a Prussian, and you have the word frontier, that means border. That means you've got to face off against the you know, Russian Empire, France, you know, some naval invasion, all that kind of stuff. In America, frontier means the opposite. It means endless open space, which we had. You can just go out there and make a new world, and if you can survive, you're it. Mm -hmm. And we actually went downward in terms of civilization. So in Boston, you're riding trolley cars and reading the Gospels, and you start to go out into the wilderness and you're right, you're, you know, rowing a canoe and reading the Old Testament. So we've almost like gone backwards as you go out into the to the frontier. So I and you can see this despite, you know, progressives who kind of FDR as well, kind of nationalized many things, made us more of a European coherent nation. We still that's not who we are. We do have a kind of outmoded political system on, on some level. Mm -hmm. It's at very least not a political system conducive to a nation state. Sure. We'll never be Finland. A coherent, in that singular sense. identity. Yeah. Right. But that's and kind so, of what and, I wonder when we so talk about like. That. But yeah. and this, uh, this, the irony of it is that we are being nationalized. I agree. The Like a guy in Maine or a guy in Wyoming who are both kind of right wing types, they both hate AOC and think mm -hmm. she's going to go take their guns or, you know, wh whatever. So it, it's like it, we're it, we're going through all of these forces, and I think there's there's also the contradiction between the ability to deal with domestic issues and then America's identity as a global empire. 
like we set we, since 1944 at the very least and probably before that we've set the terms for the world the world cannot function without us and the dollar and i'm not okay. just saying this is some wild or would function in a very jinguist. different way yeah for sure yeah. yeah and it would be horrible if this thing went down all of these ron paul types or tankies or liberals saying you know like in the american empire or whatever they don't know what that will actually entail and, mm -hmm. and a lot of horrors that that would entail. So this is, America's always been this frontier in this sense of, of expansion and globalism. It is what we are. And so there's that contradiction between like domestic affairs and our obligations as imperialists. This, you hear this with Hawley of, you know, we need a party about East Palestine and not a party about the globalist in Ukraine or something. Mm -hmm. Well, Actually, as an we American, need both. You, well, you kind of, obviously you need both, yeah, mm -hmm. to some degree. But as an American, you actually do need to think about Ukrainians, and not not just out of sympathy, which I definitely have, but out of the fact that you have an imperial obligation to think about them. Mm -hmm. And I don't. I think there's we have this. It's like one of the kind of contradictions of populism is, you know, in some ways Trump was an expression of the decline of America. Not necessarily through his actions, but through his rhetoric of like, come home, take care of ourselves, let's spend money on ourselves. You know, um, Americans are dreamers, no, no, no more immigration, build a wall. Mm -hmm. All of these things are kind of like on the some level The shriveling of an insect, the dying of like yeah. a, yeah. And, and, and even Trump, when he was a better version of Trump in the 80s, when he was on Larry King or whatever, he was still kind of like that, this, this nationalism of, of kind of bringing things in. It might have something to do with the fact that he came from Manhattan. It's this kind of like pitched battle. Yeah, but I mean, like, island. look at his investments. Like, the guy spends money and makes money like all over the world too, right? Like, no question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no question. Russia. Yeah. I think um, in, in terms of what but, you're talking about, the, the thing that I, I guess I'd like to appeal to, I guess circling back to what I said before, is it feels like we're so divided today. But in 1950, like how often was like a Jewish guy from New York debating a, a guy that lives in like, New Mexico. Right. It's never happening. So the division might have existed, but we didn't see it because those people weren't brought together. But now we've taken this version of the American experiment. We've got so many different people living in our country, which we've made work and that's awesome. But now we're like bashing heads on everything. And, and I guess it feels so lame because I, I, it just, it feels like such a lib cuck thing to say, but I feel like at the end of the day, what we have to appeal to is America has only worked so far and it will only continue to work if you can accept that some of the people living in your country are Nazis and some of the people living in your country and hate white people and want them to die, and it sucks, but as long as they're not calling for either side to be killed, you have to accept that these people are all gonna live here and the country has to function yeah, but the as The non-aggression principle is not enough. Like, I, I, I agree that that's reasonable and that we could kind of get along and maybe even kind of laugh at each other. I think there's something to be said even for like the friendliness that comes from like, telling a, 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 a an anti-Italian joke with your Italian friend, like you're kind of making fun of them, but it's, it, in a way you're kind of both being human mm -hmm. in a way. So I, I get that, but it's not enough. There has to be an overarching meaning of what it means to be an American. America is an ideological nation, just like the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was able to coherently do that. They attracted the well, minds. But they, but they didn't. But <laughs> because they, they fell they apart, right? Yeah. Right, but they lost it. But I, but I think because part of And they of collapsed the immediately. But part of the pursuit of that, part of the pursuit of that, though, was like the hardcore russification of all of the little territories and states that they took over. And I think that's part of why it wasn't like the Soviet Union naturally grew out and expanded as it, you know, expanded its empire and its ideology. A lot of it was literally like half of you guys died from a famine. We're going to go ahead and ship two million Russians down to Ukraine. We're going to go ahead and take over all of your governments in Lithuania, Estonia. We're going to go ahead and do that. And so, of course, over time, like the people there never felt like they truly had a buy into the Soviet Union. They were just kind of like subjugated by the Soviet Union. It's like, okay, well, we're here until the Soviet Union falls apart and now we're leaving immediately, which yeah. I think happened when the Warsaw Pact and the, and the Soviet yeah, Union collapsed. Yeah, that, that's, that's true to a great extent. There was, mm -hmm. there was also a kind of nation building thing of, of creating nations that didn't exist, giving them national poets. It, there's kind of countervailing forces. Mm -hmm. And, and obviously when they were invaded by the National Socialist Army, there was a call in the motherland and all that kind of stuff. And Russian nationalism, Russians are kind of mm -hmm. more equal than 
Oh, and others. to your point, Russians still define themselves largely as we beat Nazis. <laughs> and yes. that's like their calling, their that's unified their calling only card. Calling. Yeah. It's, it's almost, it's that negative identity that you, you almost see against, uh, with Americans, um, Americans as well, where it's like liberalism can't assert anything. So it becomes this kind of donut or bagel with a hole in it. So you can't really define, like, this is what it means to be a, a man in America right now. This is what it really means. Not, not, don't give me the non-aggression principle or I'm tolerant or whatever. This is what it means that my life has meaning. America isn't offering that. It's this liberalism, it's this kind of donut where there's an empty center and that it can't assert anything. And I think if anything, there's like Hitler in the center. Because so what you, is, can, you can define something of, I'm not Hitler, so, basically, yeah, so, is like liberal morality. That sucks, and that will mm -hmm. collapse. And I think, I think the Soviet example is very interesting in this regard. You can't just define yourself on the basis of, we beat the Nazis. So what does the... So I still reject this, I hope. I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm idealistic, because I would hope that we can do something that doesn't require a common enemy. Um, but like, if it had to be one, like what would it be? Um... Islam could play that role. Um, <laughs> Jeez. Um, I, I think a that won't work anymore, actually, because now all these conservative simps. I, it's so goddamn funny because four years ago I fought against so many conservatives who were like, I think that women are sluts and they shouldn't do this. I'm like, listen, bro. And I'd say this just a trick of the fucking. But it kind of sounds like you're t talking about Sharia law. I'm like, no, we don't mean that. We would never do that. Blah, blah. But now you've got all these they're Tate fans. Together, yeah. yeah, they're like, actually, Muslims are pretty base women can't drive uh they're not allowed to have a say politically sometimes like they have to stay in the house well, like i don't know maybe tate was right when he converted it was like what the f guys like five years late to the show so, so i don't even know if you could get conservatives on that no, one but no, you can't now <laughs> i think andrew tate phenomenon is actually incredible because he he's the biggest man slut on earth on one direction <laughs> gambling also, haram shit right uh, he, he's runs a casinos. criminal in another direction he is a muslim on another direction and a in a, a a masculinity icon i mean yeah i it's it's crazy, but uh, so I don't think the Islam thing will work. Although that was tried to some extent, but the, I I think Russia as a big bad enemy is a is a positive manifestation, and I think he you know Putin could kind of serve that purpose. But there also has to be this assertion of who are we mm -hmm. in opposition to whoever we fight against. And, right? Yeah, it's yeah. in opposition, but the, it's also an assertion. It's not an argument, and it's not about tolerance, not about liberalism. It's an assertion. Of identity. Identity is not an argument. Identity is an assertion. Sure. And that is what we need. Is there any common ground that really stands out to you in terms of Americans, like stuff that we really can agree on? Because it does, it is hard to find almost anything. Yeah. I don't think so, actually. That, and this is always my biggest argument against Fuentes, because, um, and anytime I would debate somebody on the very far right, I'd say, we need to defend our Eurocentric, whatever American identity. He's like, give me some common values between like the gayest dude in San Francisco and like a <laughs> farmer in rural texas and like you just can't and the reality is, is like i can point to countries around the world where conservatives are going to be way more aligned with like saudi arabian values versus like the rainbow road and fucking seattle people's values or whatever um and the reality is is it like yeah it's really hard to find a unifying identity in the united states and again this is the it's the gayest thing i've ever said but like i really do think it is the all of the different opinions that we have here that still function under one system that makes us like truly unique as a country. But I mean, maybe it's not enough. I don't know. Like, I, bro, I, do you ever play PlayStation or Xbox or whatever? No. Uh, this yeah. fucking drove me crazy as a kid. You could never, you could never just play one or the other. You had to hate the other group too. You ever mm. notice that? It's like, oh yeah, I play PlayStation. It's like Super true. Super Nintendo and Halo. For me, but yeah. Oh sure, yeah. Mortal Everybody Kombat always... Two didn't have blood on the Super Nintendo, but it did on Genesis. Oh. So we were looking. I was a Super Nintendo guy too, and this was just an example where clearly I had to get a fucking game genie if I wanted the blood to, to be blood the right in? color. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise it'd be green. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I was deeply offended. But yeah, it feels like every time when you're in a group, it's like, why can't you just like yourselves? It happens a lot with the CRT and the anti-black stuff, where it's like white people. It's like, bro, why can't you just be happy for yourselves? Like, well, do you really have to, it, it's or for white it's people and hating black people? It's because we're, an, because we're animals. I, 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 don't, I don't, we're mammals and that's why we do that. I mean, I, that's like the simplest answer. But I, I'm not saying that we should do this like merely on tribalism mm -hmm. or like, you know, uh, I, I hate my neighbors because they're, you know, they have, a, they root for a different football team or whatever. Um, there, I, what I'm arguing for is th there does need to be a bigger ideological assertion. And I think this might come in a way after we go through this period. Um, I think Biden, you know, he's managing things. It, it, it's just fine. But I think we're all kind of aware that we're kind of at the end of something. Maybe. And 
And you know, what's going to come after that? I think there are, there are a lot of, there are going to be some competing visions for a world order. Obviously, communism was a competing vision for world order. Fascism was a competing vision for world order. Um, Islam can do that. It can function in that way. It has in the past. And I, it can create some discipline in society. I feel like something that sucks today, and it, it maybe it was an artifact, or maybe it happened in the history too, I, I don't know. But it feels like everything today is so politicized that it's really, really, really hard that we can't take credit for sick shit that we do anymore. Like in 69, landing on the moon was really f cool. That must have been a really cool day to be an American. When you're yeah. sitting down and you're watching TV and we landed on the moon. That's awesome shit. But nowadays, it feels like every American invention is immediately claimed or castigated based on your political rivalry. So for instance, I, mm. and I, I might trigger you, I don't know where you guys stand on this. I personally think that the vaccination was like a model success of capitalism. That US companies, through innovation and working with other companies around the world, biotech in Germany, manufacturing of we found a way to create an, ins an insanely sophisticated vaccine in like eight months. It should have been like landing on the moon, right? It that's have been so cool. And, and it like happened. Yeah, yeah, and Trump and we, obviously wants credit for it. But like, no, that's political shit. Or on the, I'll give the flip side, so I know a lot of right leaning people are triggered right now. Um, I personally, and I hate the guy because I think politically he's the most cringy dude in the world, but Elon Musk with electric cars and rockets are cool. That's awesome. The first time you saw one of those in SpaceX rockets come back and land on the planet that was the sickest shit in the world and same thing with electric vehicles i mean we probably would have gotten there eventually but no doubt i don't even like teslas that much because the build quality is iffy but he did something really cool with teslas there's charging stations all over the united states electric cars are being taken seriously the car company is worth more than like every fucking car company on the planet but we can't give credit and that these are american inventions spacex and tesla and and the vaccine these are american things but it's all like held politically hostage now so you you said before we have to have like um we have to have domestic and international, but it feels like the international facing version is like, it's like two parents disciplining a child. Mom and dad can't provide a unified front when they're fighting with each other constantly. Right. And in the United States, when both sides are trying to tear each other apart, like how the f can we even present some kind of unified front to the rest of the world? You know, to, now with Biden, we're talking about how we wanna help Ukraine, we wanna save them, we wanna provide a strong American vision. And before under Trump, we were like, we wanna disband NATO and fuck the rest of the world. Right. And you've got people like Angela Merkel and the Australian prime minister and the Mexican president saying like, well, we can't rely on America for shit anymore. And yeah, we're like schizophrenic in terms of domestic ideas. We hate each other so much that even when we accomplish good shit, we can't take credit for it. And it makes it impossible to provide like a unified vision of what America is and stands for to the rest of the world. I agree. Yes, but I, I, I basically, th that's what I, why I'm suggesting that, that we're kind of at the end of this era, because you do need to do that. I think so. Yeah. I think we need to, well, I think we need to do, I don't know if we're at the end of an era. We, we always find a way to keep going on, but. Right. A few publications were predicting like a vibe switch coming soon. Mm. And I think that that was probably largely in terms of the arts or just people's overall disposition. But it does feel like the world as a whole is kind of growing tired of this sort of constant infighting and battling between both sides. And it does seem like there's got to be something on the other side of it, but nobody's really sure how that could possibly manifest itself at this point. Because, yeah, I hope so. I, political pundits, we're very much, we feed into each other what the media does and what people want. Like, media wants to blame people for being stupid. People want to blame the media, even though they keep watching it. Um, like, yeah, it, there, there has to start to be, there needs to be conscious decisions. I think it has to come from media first. And when I say media, I include alternative media as well. So people like you and me, um, you have to make the conscious decision to start to bridge gaps, right? You can do partisan content for your entire life, but you are evil and you're destroying the country when you do that. When you do hyper-partisan content, you are saying that like, we are different from these people on a fundamental level. They're evil, we're good, and we're gonna fight that fight and advocate for a national divorce or whatever right. some people are fighting for. It's like, no, yeah. You, we're Americans. You need to be able to talk to the guy that either wears a hood or wears a black hoodie and wants to kill cops or whatever. You have to be able to bring these people together and talk. And if you're not willing to do that, you are actively contributing to the destruction of the country, in my opinion. I, I, I totally agree. And I, I think there is space for someone who can lean out of polarization because right now, the most successful politicians just lean into it so hard and it just becomes nasty and, and meaningless. And I, there, there, that, there is a space. But again, it's like kind of an empty space because I don't know, Biden hasn't quite successfully done that, even though he has he tries. genuinely tried. I give him credit Maybe for it. Maybe just due to his age, <laughs> basically. Uh, it's why he isn't successful, but also why he tried. Because yeah. he can remember kind of back then. Yeah, because well, he was a senator for like 
7,000 years, right? And yeah, he's talked well, to and worked he's, with yeah. He, yeah, he's also like, you know, me and these segregationists, we used to get things done over in <laughs> they Washington. They did. Yeah, go to the true. old Ebbett Grill and have a liquid lunch, yeah. if you know what I mean. Yeah, so, I mean, he that's, that's who he is. I think Trump at his best kind of tried that. Um, and I wish he would. He talked about it. Dude, there were so many f- people in the campaign even, trail where it's like, are you going to turn it on and be the businessman that I think you can be? Right. But like, if you if you look at him most charitably, you could say he was kind of trying that, but he didn't. He leaned into it. He leaned into insane conspiracy cults at the end. I mean, it, it, it was a it was a disaster. But there there is a kind of space for something. And 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 that's why I do think that we need to talk about these things religiously like a vibe shift or something it's almost like a the polar ice or the polar magnetism is going to switch, switch yeah. or something it switches every few thousand really years. vibe is like a new I, age word for spirituality well, we really think, think about is, it right I, yeah. there is some kind of collective consciousness and in a collective mood and and i don't think i'm i'm being like woo woo in saying that in the sense of what what is the kind of music that defines a period where you just hear it and you know where where it is? Mm-hmm. Like if you think about the '80s and like synth pop or Madonna or you know just can't get enough and all that kind of stuff, you just you you're immediately kind of transported to that time. And at the same time, a kind of like the nihilism of punk of like actively being out of tune and screaming and slamming your instruments, that also defined a, a particular era. And even if it wasn't the most popular music, it, it was the kind of, it, it was the, the music that defined the vibe mm-hmm. of that period. So I do think we act collectively in this way. I think that's a very real thing. And it's interesting because like when I started doing hip hop podcasts like 2016, so around the same time that you were kind of invigorated with politics and in mm-hmm. a different level and generally even in within the hip hop community almost everybody would agree that music at this point hip hop is like incredibly bland and that hip hop is ready for something new, something exciting, something that doesn't feel so stale. We just have no idea what it is. And I kind of feel like that's the the general overall theme because when I interviewed Nick Fuentes, I was ready to be on Media Matters and ready to be torn apart for having a conversation with him. And nobody gave a f- And a few years ago, I would have been extremely worried about having a conversation with you. I'm quite sure nobody's going to give a f- It just feels like in a lot of ways- well, Surely the, they'll give a f- They'll give us some kind of f- but it's just not going to be anything. Yeah, that's I'm gonna, probably going to get know. more heat for this conversation. Right. Than you will. Well, don't you 